Welcome everyone. We'll get started here in just a minute. <clears throat> we have a few more people and it's always nice to see those numbers rolling up. Uh, we'll just let that happen here for a, a few more seconds and then we'll get started right away. We do try to stay tight on the half hour and know um, folks are joining us from lunches and coffee breaks and such and have busy schedules. So um, if anyone has any questions coming up as we go through, uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A if they're for the panelists who will be talking or uh, throw it in to the chat if it's just something or you want to say hello to your friend. So uh, uh, there we go. All right. Well, that uh, brings us up to the start of the hour. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the first Friday of February webinar. It's Alliteration Day. Uh, I am uh, Douglas Meyer with the Ocean Project. And if, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, these webinars are held on the first Friday of every month. Uh, and they cover topics that are of interest. And we always appreciate those suggestions. Uh, to those of you, especially in the zoo, aquarium, and museum community uh, that are looking for new ways, uh, information, insights, ideas on how to engage your audiences, inform policymakers, and overall advance uh, ocean conservation in particular, uh, but conservation more broadly. Um, so with that, I am going to start a little bit with a quick, uh, nice good news update. Um, I know many of you have been working with us uh, and in collaboration with groups like the Aquarium Conservation Partnership, AZA, it, uh, Aztec, others, uh, in efforts to advance the 30 by 30 campaign, which is this effort, as most of you I think will know by now, uh, to conserve 30% of lands and waters, including the ocean. Uh, by 2030, uh, we were really uh, so great to see so many aquariums and zoos uh, posting on social in support of the president's announcement last week committing the United States to this goal. Uh, the U.S. has now joined more than 50 other countries, including, if we have any Canadians on the call, Canada, not yet Mexico, um, lo siento por eso, uh, but hopefully Mexico soon. And uh, we will move in um, uh, forward on that campaign. There's going to be a lot more to come, but the commitment is there, which is great. And we had over two dozen uh, zoos and aquariums post on social about that. And I just wanted to relay, it was definitely noted both by people in the movement and the administration. Uh, they do pay attention to those posts and really love to see them. So those little, especially we, when we can say thank you, it's always nice. Um, but uh, moving back to our agenda for the day, uh, here's what we have in store for you. And we're really excited to have two great speakers who you may be able to see depending on how you have your screen set up. Uh, and th that's uh, Emily Routman of Emily Routman and Associates uh, and uh, Kirsty Rupert of the San Diego Zoo, uh, San Diego Zoo Global. I always have to add the global on there. Um, and what uh, we know that a lot of you um, and how you know, you're planning out your efforts and thinking a lot about how to engage your audiences. And especially the question that we've heard a lot and that has come back and why we wanted to do this webinar today is there's often this history of great history of doing educational efforts and then a lot of experimentation recently with individual behavior change and other types of action campaigns. And there's been some really good thought here uh, that Emily has done in particular with San Diego Zoo Global on how to bring those things together. And then Kirstie's gonna talk to us a little bit about how do you put that into practice with a great experiment that they did uh, at San Diego Zoo Global. So to, to start that out, I do need not, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their support for this webinar series. And also just for those who might've joined a little later to say, please feel free if you, during the webinar, we're going to uh, hear from Emily and Kirsty, and then we're going to have time for Q and A. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to put the feel uh, feel free to put them in the chat uh, or in the Q and A box, um, and we'll look to get at them uh, as we get into that Q and A session at the very end. Uh, so, without further ado, um, again, Emily Routman is a planning consultant to cultural institutions with extensive experience. I think I can say extensive, right? 
Uh, <laughs> definitely extensive experience working uh, with the zoo and aquarium community. Uh, she's going to be a familiar face to many of you on this webinar today. And it also, what I didn't know, Emily, had worked on staff at the San Francisco Zoo and the St. Louis Zoo. Uh, she specializes in guest experiences and organizational strategy, has a special interest in conservation psychology and its application in zoos and aquariums. And again, as I've said a couple of times, I think now, uh, helped San Diego Zoo Global with this thinking. So without further ado, let me pass it over to you, Emily, uh, to walk us through this exciting framework and uh, roadmap for conservation engagement that you've been developing. Oh, I almost forgot. Great question. I thought I was doing so well too. All right, we have a quick survey question for you. Before, uh, I see I get jabbering and then I forget what I'm doing. Um, we're gonna do this quick poll here. Uh, we've got a lot of people on the line today, that's great. So uh, what I wanna see, and hopefully this poll now shows up, I'm curious, uh, and this will help Emily, how many of your organizations already have a framework or plan in place for doing this kind of work? Oh, I love when these numbers go up. It's like, a, I live in a horse racing town, so what is like, okay. All right, this is really interesting, Emily. It looks like we have about a uh, little less than two thirds who have a plan or framework of some sort already in place, which is great. About a third that are saying they don't and a few that don't know. So uh, that's helpful context for you going forward. And sorry, folks, that I missed my own cue to start, start that poll. But thank you for your feedback. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily. I see there are a couple of uh, if you have a raised hand or question, please put that again in the Q&A and I'll get to those as Emily's talking. All right, thank you. Um, so most of you have decided that moving the public to take action for conservation is an essential part of your organization strategy. Uh, some of them may be, some of you may be on the fence and um, perhaps you're there, but you need to get other stakeholders in your organization on board. Wherever you are in your thinking, this presentation and uh, these resources are for you. Uh, three years ago, San Diego Zoo Global brought me on board to help them define a path forward and get everyone behind a common vision. Today, I'll introduce uh, the two-part guide to conservation engagement that came out of that work. Then Kirsty will talk about uh, an action campaign they conducted as part of their learning process. And we hope that no matter where you are in your journey, you find these helpful. Next slide. Uh, the first document in the set is the conservation engagement framework. It's a zoo and aquarium focused summary of what research tells us about our role in influencing conservation attitudes and behavior. And the second document, the conservation engagement roadmap is a practical guide <clears throat> to applying those learnings and planning conservation engagement efforts. Next. The framework presents a research-based model for how our unique relationship with our audiences can have the greatest possible value for conservation. And it starts with a look at our core practices. So for years, of course, we've said that we inspire conservation through these amazing animal experiences and all the educational elements um, like graphics and videos, staff presentations, social media, all of that. And effectively, that is an environmental education approach. And research shows that we do inspire appreciation for wildlife, a better understanding of our relationship to the natural world, um, which is valuable, but that for the most part, those effects don't translate into action very well. Next slide. So <clears throat> in recent years, the idea that we should tackle behavior more directly caught on, and uh, we began to turn our attention to social marketing. Uh, which is devoted to marketing, using marketing techniques to change um, behavior for the better. And that proved effective. Um, and that started a debate about whether it's legitimate to consider our environmental education-based practices as part of our strategy. And the answer is yes. Um, the best approach is not one or the other, but a combination. The framework shows how the two disciplines work together extremely effectively in a zoo or aquarium setting. Next. To understand how they complement each other and fit together, it helps to keep in mind 
the most basic principle of behavioral psychology. That is what people do or don't do is the result of uh, the interplay between factors that promote a behavior and other factors that oppose a behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me, so motivators and barriers. And a useful mental model is to um, imagine a reservoir with the water level representing the motivation level and water flowing over the dam representing action. You know intuitively that to get that to happen, you have to either increase the water level or lower the dam or some combination. Next. So with our wonderful wildlife experiences and those educational elements, we increase our guests' motivation to protect wildlife. We're not, we're raising that water level. So we're not necessarily uh, doing enough to trigger action, at least not predictably, but it's potentially a long-term effect. And that matters because it's much easier to move people to action if they're already motivated. Next. So what does a targeted approach to promoting action look like? Doug McKenzie Moore founded a type of social marketing he calls community-based social marketing that provides a proven strategy that uh, many zoos and aquariums uh, are using successfully. And it starts with identifying a specific action, then figure out how to increase motivation for your target audience to do it, and then also identify barriers and figure out how to remove them. And notice that it considers both, it considers both types of influences on behavior, not just motivation, but also barriers. Next. Another thing that social marketing brings to the table is a set of additional ways to motivate people uh, to take action using positive psychology techniques that tap into basic human nature and don't depend on people to take action uh, because they know they should. Um, and one example is the concept of a social norm, which is surprisingly powerful, that when we think that something is what people like us do, we're much more inclined to do it without even realizing why. And another example is public commitments. If we make a public pledge to do something, we're much more likely to follow through. So those are just a couple of examples. Uh, next slide. And uh, remember the other part that social marketing brings to, into the picture is the idea of lowering barriers <clears throat> or facilitating action. Pick a very specific action that helps wildlife and that your audience can reasonably be expected to do. Figure out what makes it hard or inconvenient and fix that. And ideally, if you can, make it fun. Also help people overcome any hesitation they might have that they can take action and that it will help because lack of confidence is a barrier too. Next. So this, in a nutshell, is the unified approach described in the framework. With our animal experiences and those educational elements, we increase caring and understanding. Then with social marketing techniques, we can further bump up intent to, to take action and, and we'll realize some success with that combination. But when we also lower those barriers and facilitate action, we greatly increase our success. And this isn't a hypothetical model, it's a description of what recent successful efforts in zoos and aquariums look like. We know that this works. Next. It helps that we're starting from an advantageous position. A significant proportion of our guests already care about wildlife, uh, more so than the general public as a whole. And they appreciate it when we help them make a difference for wildlife, and especially when we make it easy. Next. Um, that said, of course, that's not true for everyone. Um, the framework includes a section about how to consider different audiences when developing uh, your goals and approaches and measuring your results. Uh, for those loyal repeat visitors, we should aim not just to inspire, but also to facilitate action. For those visitors who aren't as enthusiastic about wildlife, for them, our goal might be uh, for them to come away seeing animals as more fascinating and worth protecting than they had thought. And then for kids, appropriate goals will depend on their age and developmental stage. Next. So a handy way to remember the elements of uh, this engagement strategy is with the acronym CARE. C is for cultivate caring, meaning build appreciation and understanding. A is for amplify intent using social marketing based positive psychology techniques. And R is remove barriers. E introduces a new idea, which is to expand impact. Strategize how your efforts can have an impact beyond one individual taking one action one time. Next. 
That's the gist of the framework. The roadmap then offers a guide to applying those principles to practice. And it starts by identifying how the ways we engage our audiences, which you can think of as our tools, fit into those four care strategies. So let's take a look at those. Next slide. <clears throat> Some of these will be familiar territory, uh, uh, and some of them may be new directions for your organization. Within C, cultivate caring. Tool one is our bread and butter, our animal experiences. Tool two, also within C, are those educational elements. Anything from graphics to staff presentations to uh, docent cards, social media, education programs. Then in A, amplify intent. This is where we bring in the social marketing. Tool three is to promote a specific action, like skip the straw to save sea turtles, which is a, a, a shift from our usual approach of talking about general things you can do, like uh, reducing your use of plastics or offering long lists of options. Then tool four also within Amplify Intent is uh, those social marketing techniques like the um, social norm and public pledges that, that bump up uh, intention or interest in taking action. We call that uh, uh, positive engagement, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and then tool five under R uh, is to um, uh, facilitate action or remove barriers, figure out what might stop people from taking action. Say, if you want them to plant a pollinator garden, maybe they don't know what pollinator friendly plants work in their region or where to find them. So it's up to you to solve that problem. And then before we look at tool six, a word, I wanna say something about uh, conservation messaging, next. Given the nature of our relationship with our audiences, it's important to keep conservation messaging positive, which can be hard. The group Conservation Optimism has developed a free downloadable positive communication toolkit that offers tips that are perfect for our settings. So they outline some basic elements of positive conservation messaging, conveying the idea that while there is a problem, it is solvable and that we're all part of the solution. Next. <clears throat> so now we get into E, expand impact and tool six, which comes in three varieties, three different ways to increase impact beyond what you can achieve with one person in the moment. The first is to extend the relationship beyond the visit so you can continue to motivate and facilitate action. So uh, for example, by setting up an online community the second is to leverage your audience's uh, actions for change <clears throat> to drive change at a higher level, such as legislation or industry practices. And the third is to set up partnerships uh, in order to maximize the number of people you reach, like the Gorilla Safe Collaborative does with their Gorillas on the Line cell phone recycling campaign. Next. Those are the elements of the care approach. The roadmap outlines the specific types of outcomes that can be promoted with each of the tools. And on the left are those environmental education-based practices which cultivate the caring and knowledge that are the foundation of an environmental ethic. And as you move along the spectrum, you get into the social marketing tools that promote action with an understanding of what each kind of experience can, can contribute to audience outcomes, you can create a plan for how to combine them in order to achieve your goals. Next. The roadmap includes an appendix about how to determine if an action is an appropriate focus for a campaign because you can't do everything uh, and a worksheet you can use to document your plan. That's a quick look at these resources. We hope you find them useful. And more importantly, we want you to feel confident that you can and should help your audiences take action without losing sight of the value of those core practices, which are still important. Kirsty will tell you about how San Diego Zoo applied the care approach to a pilot action campaign, but first back to Douglas. Hey, thanks so much, Emily. And that was awesome. Uh, as I put in the chat, uh, those documents, I realize that's a very top line overview for y'all. So the, in the chat, uh, there's a link, there will be a, a web a kind of a quick summary blog with these downloadable documents. And also for, we had a question in the Q and A, uh, there will be a recording of this webinar for those who you may think would be interested and what, but didn't have a chance to join us here today. Now I am ready with the second poll question, uh, which is to help uh, Kirsty uh, uh, come forward. Uh, and let me go ahead and launch that now. And what we really wanna know here is to, how many of your organizations have already asked uh, your visitors to take a specific action like the ones Emily described 
uh, uh, how many of you have already done that? And while you're answering that, let me introduce Kirsty. Uh, Kirsty Rupert uh, is a social scientist on the community engagement team at San Diego Zoo Global, uh, the Beckman Center for Conservation Research, more specifically. Her work focuses on understanding the human dimensions of wildlife conservation and evaluation of conservation learning programs. Uh, she played a key role in applying this framework and roadmap that we've been hearing about uh, to engage visitors around support for the Endangered Species Act. And this is a particularly interesting one because um, it's so highly relevant to the work that aquariums and zoos do. Uh, so let's take a look here, uh, Kirsty, at the results of our poll. Beep, beep, beep. And the results suggest that we have about three quarters that have already done some uh, experimentation in this realm. Uh, about 20% said uh, that they have not and about 4% uh, didn't know. So uh, there we go. And with that, let me end the poll and uh, turn things over to you. Thank you, Douglas. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us today. Um, no matter where you're at in your organization in terms of implementing um, conservation action campaigns, I hope that um, there are some concepts that are either familiar or um, emphasize that Emily shared. Uh, as Emily presented, she worked with San Diego Zoo Global to develop the CARE framework and roadmap, and I'm here to share about our first application of these concepts through an advocacy campaign to strengthen enforcement of the Endangered Species Act. Um, I also wanna note that I am speaking on behalf of a much larger team as people across our organization contributed to this campaign. Um, my specific role was as an evaluator to measure progress toward our intended outcomes. Um, so when our organization was in early discussions about a campaign to drive action, we thought through multiple criteria. A key one was aligning with our mission to unite our expertise in animal care and conservation science with our dedication to inspiring passion for nature. We also thought through what actions can make a difference, so is there room for improvement, and which actions are relevant to our guests. So from these factors, we narrowed in on something related to the Endangered Species Act. Um, in 2019, enforcement of ESA regulations were weakened, even though the ESA has broad bipartisan support from the public. So in a way, um, this situation was one of the lower hanging fruits, um, which honestly was appealing to us because this was also about proofing a concept. Uh, we needed to bring many departments together um, to plan and implement this campaign. So choosing a topic that we could all really rally behind uh, was definitely appealing. Um, so we were building confidence in our ability to drive conservation action with our community. So in the next few slides, I'm going to share how our campaign lined up with some of the tools that Emily presented. Next slide, please. So tool number one, um, starting with inspirational wildlife experiences. This is a strength shared by many zoos, aquariums, and informal learning institutions. And for us, this is where the campaign would be introduced to guests. Specifically, we integrated the campaign at exhibits like the California Condor and at guided education tours like the caravan safaris and the Africa tram at the safari park and the bus tours at the San Diego Zoo. And we also had booths set up by retail locations and animal encounters. Next slide, please. So at these experiences, we needed unified messaging across a framework, and that brings us to tool number two. Uh, we described what has come from the ESA, so sharing the positive messaging um, that Emily emphasized, like how it has kept almost every species on the list from extinction. Uh, we described the connection between the ESA and recovery of the California condor, which is a conservation success story in which San Diego Zoo Global finds great pride and identity. Uh, and we also talked about what's changed, uh, which is not to the law itself, uh, but rather how it is enforced and in turn, its potential to protect species and habitats. And then these messages really closed with um, how everyone can help. Next, please. Which brings us to tool number three, promoting specific actions. Um, in our case, that action was to contact your legislator, um, but there are barriers that keep guests from taking that action once they get back home from their visit to the zoo or the safari park. Next. So we wanted to assist with that specific action by enabling our visitors to contact our government right then and there. Um, many of our guests will have just had a wildlife experience with conservation messaging. So then we added tables at the exits of those tours and exhibits to sign cards that San Diego Zoo Global would then deliver for them. Um, cards were addressed to the House Natural Resources Committee and they required names, 
zip codes and signatures for those willing to say that they want effective implementation of the ESA. Next. And so over a few weekends, we generated 20,000 signed cards, which when pooled together, we felt like made a stronger statement upon delivery, um, which brings us to our final tool, um, leveraging action for collective impact. So even though individuals signed those cards, San Diego Zoo Global could help our visitors share their voices with the right people. Next. And so the, adv the advocacy campaign not only helped elevate guest actions, but showed our organization that centering our guest experiences around conservation action is something that we can do. Um, it required resources like time across many departments, uh, but it also unified us around this shared goal. And so with communication, we can apply those guiding principles from the care framework. Um, our evaluation results um, have helped boost our confidence as well, since the large majority of guests, regardless of whether or not they sign cards, reported beliefs that they think San Diego Zoo Global should be engaging with guests about conservation policies like the ESA. Um, guests also reported high levels of trust and information about conservation that we share, and that those signed cards were more um, those that signed cards were more confident in explaining the ESA to friends and family than before their visit, and when compared to those that were not exposed to the campaign. So I hope that my quick overview demonstrates how we use the CARE roadmap to guide our planning as an organization, um, and that it's doable. Um, and all of us here today can move forward in our work to protect nature. Um, so with that, I think we just have a conclusion slide with our information. There's a short video overview of the campaign, which I think Douglas said uh, will be posted on a blog about today's webinar, along with the um, CARE documents. Um, I also have a short report that I can send you over email. So I can't post it, but I can send it to you over email if you're interested. Um, and with that, I think we have a small chunk of time for discussion. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, let me just share that out really quickly, Kirsty. Uh, the link is there. It's under the oceanproject.org news, which is just our list of blogs. If you actually scroll down through those blogs, you'll see a lot of other experiments that other zoos and aquariums have done. And, and we've had the privilege of working back and forth with Emily and talking to San Diego Zoo Global a little bit. You'll see that other places have done this with very similar results to what Kirsty described. So uh, it really is encouraging as a community uh, for, to pull all these resources and to share these stories about what, what's worked. Uh, if you're interested, there's a couple of efforts that are ongoing um, that we're doing. One is 30 by 30. There's a new AZA group or community on the AZA network. Uh, join there if you want to be part of that. Uh, we're going to be, there's people already sharing information and ideas about how to engage uh, members and, and foreign policymakers on 30 by 30. Uh, and we're going to have a new campaign, uh, we, looks like, around fisheries policy, which may be a more select group, but uh, email me directly. And last but not least, before I drop the share and go to Q&A, uh, our next webinar will be, shockingly, first Friday of March, uh, which is, again, the 5th. So let me stop the share, uh, pull it into discussion, and uh, let me check here in the Q&A. I don't think we have any uh, Q&A questions just yet, so I'm curious. Uh, with a couple of minutes we have left, and we'll stay over if others have time. Emily and Kirsty, what's your one piece of advice you would give to those in this uh, participating in this webinar uh, that you learned? What's your one piece of advice for them? Kirsty, do you want to start? Uh, sure, I can. I can say that when thinking about um, conservation action um, campaigns with our audiences, um, something that I constantly have to remind myself is not to make assumptions about people's motivations or the barriers that are tied to these actions, um, and to put the work into to talking to diverse audiences about what those motivations or barriers might be um, for each specific campaign or action moving forward. Um, Emily, what about you? That's great. That's really funny because I think that was the first thing I was going to say. And I will add to that, that this, this idea of, when, uh, of thinking about both motivating and facilitating works in every aspect of these efforts. And it also, frankly, works in life in general. But there are a lot of um, uh, uh, sort of partners or, or intermediaries involved in whatever it is you do, a lot of layers. And your organization, you know, if this is a change for them or the people in it, think about not only how you're going to motivate them, but find out what their barriers are. As Kirsty said, do the work to, to learn from them um, what their thought process is and how this aligns or doesn't align with 
with their values and their feelings. Um, and uh, you know, it includes uh, 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 partners, uh, like conservation partners, right? So if you wanna work with another organization, um, what motivates them, what gets them excited, what makes it easier for them, what are the barriers uh, to them uh, for in working with you? Or, or uh, maybe players in, in the solutions. Uh, and an example is like with Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch, they're asking people to buy sustainable seafood. Well, it has, the sustainable seafood has to be available. Yeah. So they also had to work with restaurants and motivate and facilitate them, not just badger them and not just leave it up to the guests. They also had to work with, uh, it went all the way to fisheries, global fisheries policy in their case. Um, so that works. And, and the other thing I would mention since I mentioned Seafood Watch is if you can't do all this heavy lifting, if it feels like too much, you can join an existing initiative like Seafood Watch or Gorillas on the Line or work with partners to share the, share the workload. Kirsty, let me uh, just ask you, uh, one thing that impressed me is this sounds like it was a good experience for the staff too. Like you brought together people from across departments. Uh, and then my, my follow-up to that is the engagement itself didn't last very long to get those great results. I mean, how long, so talk, can you talk to those two points? Like how did the staff come together and then how long was a typical engagement with a visitor? Definitely. So I think that um, in that in that summary document, and I want to point out Peter Gilson is um, joining us on this panel too. He's an education specialist at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park um, and helped coordinate uh, um, this campaign. I think that the first planning meeting happened in early October 2019. We took about two months to develop the messages, to integrate these messages into scripts and um, and train the volunteers that are that are situated at these booths. Um, but we were blown away by how quickly the cards um, were used up. So I think that we needed to reorder twice and then we finally put a cap at 20,000 cards. Um, so by mid-December, uh, we had this massive um, really package ready to deliver to legislators. Um, the plan was to do that at an event in the spring that got derailed for obvious reasons. Um, but it really showed us that rallying together around this um, in a relatively short period of time is something that we can do, especially if we're thoughtful about applying key principles from the framework and staying true to what our key objectives are. So we had tons of departments involved in this. Um, and in that way, I do think it really helped build our confidence as well. There was a second part to your question, Douglas, and I'm forgetting it. Yeah, and actually I can bring in the Q&A though. It's good timing. Uh, how long was a typical engagement with mm -hmm. a visitor? And then what did you track the percentages? We actually have some numbers at the Ocean Projects work, but did you track some percentages to get to that 20,000 card number? Yeah, so the the length of time for engagement varied and this is important to think through for our organizations as well so um say for the bus tour that's um a somewhat contained and, and bounded experience people are literally sitting on the bus um and so in that way um, the messages could be um integrated throughout and repeated a few times that's different than something like the booth set up by the Condor exhibit that was very much guests self-selected into those conversations. So the very the length of time for that would be var variable. Um, in our evaluation, we also tracked um, if somebody signed a pledge, if someone signed a card, um, at which experiences did they did they um, participate in that day? Uh, I think that the highest percentage of cards were gathered after the bus tours in particular, um, which also was helpful for us in thinking about how to, um, you know, uh, focus these efforts on particular experiences. That's great, Kirsty. And um, there's an experiment that we did that I can point people to there in response to part of that question. Uh, in the chat, which was we looked at different types of engagements the way you did. Mm -hmm. And we were finding anywhere from 12 and a half percent of those who watched a 90 second PSA willing to sign a card. That was on fisheries policy, which is I think is a, is a, hard, a heavier lift than, uh, than endangered species. Uh, up to 60% when they had the one-on-one -on -one staff engagement mm -hmm. would sign a card. The, the trade-off there was often one of the bigger number reach from something like a bus tour or a large group presentation versus the time it takes to do one-on-one. -on -one. Now, when I go, um, I know we're a little bit over the time. Emily and Kirsty, are you okay to answer a couple mm -hmm. more questions? And I understand yeah. that you need to drop off. Um, but uh, there's another question here, which is, uh, how did you survey guests to gather the follow-up information? Was there a quick questionnaire after the card, a follow-up after the visit? Uh, I think that's to you, Kirsty. 
Yeah, so we uh, thought through what would be um, most closely tied to the the day, their, that day's visit at the zoo, but not immediately after um, they actually set, were exposed to the messaging or signing the card. So what we did was we're setting up star or booths for a questionnaire with an iPad and, and run by volunteers and Judith Coates in our marketing department at the entrance and the exit to the zoo. So when guests came into the zoo and completed the questionnaire, we gave them a small little ticket so that we could pair their questionnaires before and afterward. The incentive for coming back and filling out the exit questionnaire as well was um, a license plate cover. Um, so we're really grateful for people that took their time to complete this um, these surveys. Um, right. Um, it also helped us think through retention. So we were only able to pair a subset of the questionnaires that we got. Um, but in this way, we knew that data were being collected during the same day that they were exposed to the messaging, but not immediately afterward. Um, so the, 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 question, the surveys at the front and the exit of the zoo were the, was the best route for us. And a question for both of you, I think, uh, from one of our, from Mike asks, did you have any guests, and we get this one a lot, uh, did you have any guests with negative experiences? If so, what did you do? So I'm curious, Emily, I would imagine like me, you've heard that question a lot when, when staff are considering one of these. Uh, I would love to hear from your experience generally, Emily, and then Kirsty to your experience specifically with this uh, ESA experiment. Right, in general, you know, so I wasn't of course out on the floor doing this in, at San Diego, but I've done these kinds of things in other contexts. And um, I think it's just really important to keep that positive um, messaging and that positive tone. And I think uh, you mentioned something, Douglas, once about how, you know, be careful about how you craft your appeal and that you don't make it feel like people should be obligated to do this or that you're a bad person if you don't. You make it an invitation and you make it really clear that this is an opt-in, you know, if you would like to join us. And then you also do, you're very careful about not sounding partisan uh, and saying, if this sounds like a good idea to you, um, then you know, uh, we can help get your opinions to the right people who would like, you know, who, who need to hear this. So I, the whole point is to not badger, to not insist that you're right and they're wrong, not to in any way appear to be in opposition to anybody in your audience. Um, just welcome and facilitate those who are interested in being part of this positive action. Thanks, Emily. And Kirsty, did you guys have any negative experiences or interactions with guests? I'm going to speak quickly and then see if Peter wants to, to step up as well. I, um, I think that what benefited us in, in this particular case was the fact that those that were engaging in these conversations were trained interpreters and trained volunteers. And so it, the having difficult conversations about complex conservation issues is not unique to this campaign in particular. Um, and those difficult discussions are something that we want to start engaging in with guests while being able to make connections to positive um, conservation success stories as well as specific actions that people can take. But Peter, is there something you wanna add? First of all, let's welcome Peter back with the good news that San Diego Zoo has reopened. Yay. <laughs> yes, it is good to be back on site with people here. Um, I'll say, as far as this campaign, we had, I would say, probably about a handful of instances I was ever aware of where people had some sort of negative response, um, never anything very significant. Mostly it was just people sort of saying, no, they weren't interested in signing the petition, or in this case, the cards. Um, we really stated it as an opportunity. We sort of gave our... Um, our vision for it, right? We, uh, whether it was on the bus tour or the uh, Africa tram, we would say what we believed and why the Endangered Species Act was important to the species that we work with. And we said, if you would like to stand with us in support, then you're welcome to sign this card. And then the actual table where they would sign after getting off of the bus or the tram was sort of loosely facilitated in the sense that there was someone standing there, but they weren't asking people to come up if they wanted to sign. It was really there to make sure they had a pen and they had a card and they knew where to put that card once they had finished with it. So, um, but I would agree with what Kirsty said, having a team of trained interpreters and as an organization, having already a strong method to get messaging to our frontline team was critical. It took some time to develop what that messaging was, but the system was in place to get that new messaging out and make sure that it was gonna be consistent across the organization. Yeah, it's funny. It almost reminds me of, we, we've heard this feedback a lot now that 
the more time you spend preparing a shorter message, it's mm -hmm. like the old Mark Twain line, right? I didn't have time to write a, a short letter, so I wrote a long one. If you put the time in, people tend to get the better responses and not, we also have not heard in our other work, negative experiments um, or negative experiments, excuse me, negative, a lot of negative feedback. It's just like what you described um, where people, if they weren't interested, they kind of walk away and, uh, and, and that's the way it is. Well, I, I know we're up, but we're about 10 minutes over, but it's always great to have all of the interest. Um, I, I don't know if uh, Emily or Kirsty, I'd love to give you guys the parting words uh, and just remind folks if they are interested, uh, please go download those really good documents that Emily has compiled with San Diego Zoo Global. Take a look at the video that Kirsty and her team, uh, including Peter, have put together about their ESA experiment. Uh, and there is a lot more um, on the Ocean Projects website about other zoos and aquariums that have done kind of similar efforts uh, that, that we can learn from collectively to, and you know, make sure we're repeating each other's successes. We're embracing recycling when it comes to successes and we're not repeating each other's failures. I do have one final question that just popped in. Uh, the difference between signing a petition and signing a pledge, um, the, Petitions uh, are going up to s s someone offering ask for a change. The pledges tend to be personal behaviors. Maybe actually we close on that, uh, Kirsty and Emily, with any final words. We've noticed a kind of general movement in the zoo and aquarium world, kind of with a little less emphasis maybe on personal actions like use recycle bags to more where you're, it's a personal action or a commitment that's elevated up. And I think Kirsty, you mentioned that as your last step that the zoo took that, brought the opinions up to the policymakers. Uh, maybe, maybe speak to that and then any final parting words that you have. I'll just say, I, yep, so go ahead. I was yeah. gonna say, um, Douglas, that distinction is spot on and I would emphasize that. If in my presentation I said pledge, that was a mistake in, in wording because we weren't asking people to pledge to a specific action themselves. We were asking them to sign a card um, that to legislators that would, be parallel more to a petition. And I think that distinction is important, but pledging is a, is a social marketing tool that works in other instances. And I know that zoos and aquariums have been able to apply that as well, particularly when those pledges are durable, public, um, and specific to those actions. So keep that in mind as you're exploring social marketing tools, if it makes sense for your campaign and organization. My parting words are just saying thank you for listening and inviting us to be here today, as well as to all my colleagues at San Diego Global that made this campaign happen, so. Thank you. Uh, Emily? Any uh, uh, well, uh, just parting words, I think, first of all, I agree with uh, everything Christy said. Um, and, and one thing I would point out is that signing a card or a comment card, that is an action, yeah. but you're elevating it. You're not at, you know, that's not the end of the story. You're now taking that and using it as a tool in your efforts. Um, a, a pledge is just a commitment to take action and it is not an action in and of itself. So you keep that in mind. Uh, you can't measure success in terms of how many people pledge because you don't know how many people then follow through. You have to take take it a little bit farther if you're looking for concrete measures of action. Um, that's why, that's, oh, sorry, Emily, I was gonna say, maybe that's why the kind of, these or these sorts of efforts, like what, what San Diego has used on and what you're talking about, where you provide people with an action that can be elevated up for a larger change at scale, that, that that's maybe why these are taking root a little, and we're seeing more of The it. direct facilitation of action then you know you've accomplished something. So like gorillas in the line with cell phone recycling, they can count the cell phones and they are doing what they can to make it easier. They set up the recycling logistics for the partners. The partners set up the, the logistics for the individuals to make it really easy to donate uh, their cell phones. So um, a pledge is a step towards a conservation outcome. It is not a conservation outcome in and of itself, but it can be a useful tool depending on the circumstances. And there have been a, um, there was a question just thrown into the Q&A, so I'll address it in this, which is uh, we have had, I would look at um, the uh, Philadelphia Zoo uh, did a really interesting experiment where they followed up on a pledge for, um, they tried to actually track a pledge to reduce your home energy use. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it proved, I think the, the big takeaway there, I wish Wei Ying was here, um, but the big takeaway uh, that her team had on that 
was people were actually very willing to be traced, but it was very difficult to track and incredibly time and resource intensive to track pledges for individual behaviors or things that would happen off site. And we've also, I think, seen people, once they leave the inspiration that's there or the inspiration of the immediate contact kind of dissipates. And I'm kind of looking at you, Kirsty, to see if that aligns with your experience, but it, it, telling people, oh, go later, look at a website, we've not seen a lot of success with that. Well, that's why it's important to look at the uh, some of these additional tools, the remaining connected after the visit, right? So yeah. if they, right, if you can capture that pledge somehow and then connect, make an online connection, and then you can send them recognition, you know, you can say, we'll send you a coupon for a sustainable product. Or if you tell them, this is one thing that happened at Houston Zoo and the people pledged to use reusable bags, is when people made the pledge, they said, they asked them, can we follow up with you and check to see if you did it? Well, that follow up provides recognition and acknowledgement that they took action as well as this accountability that increases the success beyond if people just make the pledge um, go away and, ne and never hear from you. So that's why I say a pledge can be a really useful tool so long as it is integrated into other elements that make it translate into action. There's other parts to, you know, there's other steps beyond the pledge itself. And I guess we're at the final, final, final word, but Kirsty, did you, I didn't know if you had something else to say there. Oh, just going to um, reiterate that, you know, intention doesn't always translate to behavior and there are also biases inherent with self-report data. We haven't been yeah. able to measure direct behavior as part of our campaigns, but what I will say is I don't want that to be a deterrent for people to plan and implement these campaigns as well as trying to evaluate them. Um, the environmental education research communities, the conservation psychology research communities, we're always trying to um, improve our, our research tools and methods available as well as accessibility of those um, while keeping in mind the limitations of some methods. But I don't want that to be a reason that this doesn't happen. <laughs> Well, great. Well, listen, thank you. We had so many people stay with us for these little extra 15 minutes of chat. It's great to see the interest. And uh, I'm going to sign off here now with huge thanks again uh, to Emily Routman and Kirsty Rupert of San Diego Zoo Global uh, for sharing their, their time and experience and expertise with us today. And uh, any other follow-ups, uh, look forward to those. And please go do download those documents, look at the summary video. And thanks also to our uh, special guest, Peter, who for uh, joining in at the end there too. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Please stay Thank safe. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.